Hey, Nate. Yes, Sam. Do you ever wonder what grad students do with all their time? Do they have any extra time outside of research? I don't know. Hey, hey I, got I got a question, question about, about that. that. Welcome to another episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That, and we are in season two. I'm still Sam. I'm still Nate, and this is still a podcast and video series where we talk about all the fascinating research going on here at the Penn State Everly College of Science. On this episode of the pod, we talked to Nicole Famulero and Albany Hendrickson Stives, who are graduate students in Christine Keating's lab in chemistry here in the Everly College of Science, and we talked to them about what it's like to be a graduate student and about their research. And we should note that uh, we recorded the interview with Nicole and Albany way back in, what, February, before uh, we were all working from home. So we are joined here in the studio today by Albany Hendrickson Stives and Nicole Famularo, and they are graduate students in chemistry here in the Everly College of Science at Penn State. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, um, it, we've peaked. <laughs> We peaked now. We, we have to defend and move on with our life because it's never going to get better. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about your research? Yeah, so we both are in Chris Keating's lab in chemistry, and we study particle assembly. And so what that means is we look at particles that are like one one thousandth of a diameter of hair and things like that. Um, and we try and figure out ways to make them interact with one another because when something is that small, how do you see it? How do you control where it is? And as to like why you would even want to, um, when you start to get things really small down, like close to atomic dimensions, um, you know, things start getting weird, weird wonky science and interesting. And specifically, we think about it in terms of what cool optics can happen from that. Yeah, so to control like the particle assemblies, we focus on electric fields. Uh, there's many ways that you can assemble particles. Some people use evaporation, um, both just on like a table, just using um, the heat of the room or in an oven. Um, people use magnetic fields, uh, things like that, but we focus on electric fields. So we put our particle solution. So typically we use um, water um, and we put them in a little electric field and we have to use a microscope to see them uh, because obviously they're nano and micro particles. Um, but then we use the electric field in like the shape of an electrode that we use um, to control the shape and structure um, and the way that the particles assemble with that electric field. Cool. Um, and so you guys have the honor, I guess, of being our first graduate student guests. And can you tell us a little bit how you decided maybe to go to grad graduate school? Yeah, for me, it wasn't like a thing that I always wanted to do as like a kid. Um, no one in my family went to get their bachelor's um, in anything. So for me, I was just like, yes, I'll get my bachelor's in chemistry and then I'll just get a job. Um, but I did um, research in undergrad mm -hmm. and it was on environmental chemistry. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I didn't know you could do research in undergrad. And then my professor was like, you should just continue on. Like grad school's a thing. I didn't even know grad school's a thing until my junior year of college, actually. And I was like, oh, I might as well try. They told me you can get paid to do research and get a degree and like learn more about chemistry. And I was like, why not? I might as well try it. Yeah, I think my story is really similar. I also didn't know until my junior year of college. Um, I didn't even know I wanted to do chemistry. I didn't even take a chemistry class until my sophomore year. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I like knowing why things work the way they do. And chemistry kind of explains that. Mm -hmm. um, and then somebody mentioned that, like, if you get a PhD, probably in anything, but like you have a little bit of creative control over what you want to think about and study. And so that was appealing to me. And then the money, too. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you both do your undergrad degrees? So I went to Syracuse University in New York. Um, so in our one institute, we had a lot of research mm -hmm. similar to here. It, about half the size, but so yeah. pretty decent school. I was on the other end of things. I um, went to a primarily undergraduate institution called Monmouth University in New Jersey on the coast. Nice. So what does a grad student do from day to day? So every day is a little different, <laughs> like today. We get to do yeah. fun stuff every once in a while. 
Um, I mean, you do fun stuff every day. But say a typical week would probably be, for me, I'd spend maybe 25% of my time responding to emails, um, <laughs> making sure everything's like in order, um, planning my week, some experiments, re reserving instrument time in the MSC. Um, and then the rest of my time is half and half between meetings and actually getting to work in the lab. Um, there's a lot of time management and organizing that goes into everything um, just to keep you sane or attempt to keep you sane. And you have to be really diligent right. about your time. Yeah, I think you have to wear so many different hats. I have so many different hats that I need like a metaphorical closet for all of my hats. But like sometimes you're writing papers and documents to like justify to grant agencies like, hey, I'm using a bunch of government money. Here's what I'm doing with it. I'm not just like sipping my ties on the beach. Um, sometimes you're doing experiments. Most of the time they're failing. And so then you're going back and seeing, well, what can I do to tweak it to try and get some more information out of this system? Um, Sometimes you are mentoring undergrads. Sometimes what neither of us do now, which is nice, but a lot of grad students have to teach. And so that is a big um, time sink. Forgot about that. Mm -hmm. A worthwhile one, but yes. it does take up a lot of time. So in the chemistry department, do you do any teaching? Yeah, so typically if you don't come in with a scholarship or fellowship, you'll teach your first year. Um, and I got to teach um, general chemistry here, Chem 110 um, and Chem 111. So that's the lab section. I also got to teach um, Chem 203, which is a lower level organic chemistry class. So I got a wide variety of teaching experience here. But everyone in the chemistry department has to teach um, at least one time. Yeah, I TA'd PCHEM, which was crazy because it was my first semester here. And people taking PCHEM are generally juniors or seniors. So I was like six months older than them and had all of this authority and was kind of terrifying. But we made it. So you mentioned you were both in Chris Keating's lab. Um, what is the relationship between you and your advisor? Is how much kind of guidance are you getting? How much time sort of one-on-one -on -one do you get with them? I'd say um, working for Chris Keating is like one of the best things ever. Um, she's a really good mentor. Mm -hmm. She, I'd say, guides us a lot in our research. Um, we typically... We have group meeting once a week, so we at least see her one time a week um, for like two hours. Um, we also have subgroup meetings because we have two individual types of groups within our group, one that focuses on cell mimics um, and then our side, which is particle assembly. And so we have another meeting, so that's two times a week. And then you can also have indivi individual meetings with her um, set up on your own. Or you can just pop in her office because she's like always in her office and willing to chat, especially about research um, or anything else. But if you have a question about research, she's always willing to be like, hey, here's some advice I'd have. Um, so I think our relationship is like very close. And like as far as research, research comes, um, it's like pretty intimate and we always ask questions and she always knows what's up. This type of relationship like between a student and advisor is one of the things that varies the most across graduate school. Like you can have an advisor who is very hands on, who's in lab with you, who's dictating exactly what your next experiments are going to be. You could work for a really famous PI who already has his kind of breadth of expertise and kind of just gives you general directions, but they're busy with other things. And so I think that working for Chris is a nice mix because there is some like creative control. Like I've definitely brought some ideas to the project, but she's also there um, if I need. And so I think it just depends on the personality style of the mentor and the grad student as to what's best compatible. Yeah, for sure. And what do you guys kind of see as the goal of graduate school, the goal of getting a PhD? That's a really good question. Sometimes you have to bring yourself back to that. that <laughs> what is the goal here? Always. Because um, it's easy to get lost in your research. Um, for me, the goal ultimately is to learn how to conduct quality science in a reliable manner, um, while also getting to be an expert in a specific field. Mm -hmm. um, and while doing that, getting to like find my mentors, find a network for myself for like the rest of my life and like 
just have a group of people that I'm like, I can go to for advice. Yeah, I think that that was a really, really good answer. And so I probably am going to just sound like a mumbling doof now. But um, I think that another thing, too, was building a portfolio of like science communication skills. And so in terms of like, first off, of course, you have to figure out how to become a good scientist and design good experiments um, and how to document and all of those things. But then the next part of that, I think, is being able to relay it to people who are coming from all different backgrounds, because it's easy to have a technical conversation with someone in your field. Like we both know the same things. We have the same skill set. But then try talking to someone even in biochemistry. And it's like, oh, what are all those symbols and stuff? And so I think that's important. I was recently, and also to to bank off your answer on mentoring, sorry, I'm rambling. I said I would ramble. I was thinking about like, what is my favorite moment in grad school? And this is so ridiculously corny. So corny. My favorite moment was when you passed your orals. What? Yeah. And so the oral comprehensive exam is like a big exam partially through graduate school that you have to take. And it pretty much decides whether or not you're going to go on and get your PhD or whether maybe the master's track is a better suited fit for you. Um, And everybody gets really understandably nervous about it. And so like, first off, I'll just say that Albany passed with flying colors so easily. But like seeing you prepare and seeing like maybe hopefully I was a part of your like journey and building your skill set and things like that. It was just so rewarding. And so I think what I like about science and what I want to get from it is this communal, like we all work towards the common goal of building up science knowledge. And probably not many of us get to make a breakthrough discovery that is world changing right when you make it. But it's kind of like we're laying the foundation for the people that come after us. And so that is why I was so excited when you passed orals. Good job, girl. So what are the steps in your graduate career? So there's weirdly not that many like standardized steps, at least for chemistry. I know that it's very different across like the university um, for PhDs. But so our first big step, at least for me, was getting my teaching requirement done, um, which was in my first year, Um, taking classes. So we have to take five and we have to qualify in three different areas of chemistry um, out, of, out of the five different areas. Um, I qualified in physical chemistry, analytical chemistry, and inorganic chemistry. So those are the three I picked. What does um, it mean to qualify? You basically have to show that you have an understanding of the chemistry within that field. Um, do you do that it. with like a test or is that through the class work? You you start with a test. So when we come in, at least in chemistry, um, we get tested on the five different branches of chemistry, which is organic, inorganic, analytical, biochem. Physical. Physical. Oh, the one I'm in. <laughs> um, physical, yes. Um, and so you can either pass those tests or you can fulfill it by taking a class that is designated as those types. So either of those. Yep. So I did it through classes mm-hmm. and you have to take a total of five. Um, I took them within my first year. Some people take two years. Um, After that, after your first year of graduate school, you have something called your candidacy exam. And you basically meet with your committee, which is your advisor and an outside member who is not in the chemistry department and two people within the chemistry department. And you kind of tell them what your research is about so they can get to know you and they can give you advice where to go in the future. Um, you then have something called second year seminar, which is kind of specific to chemistry. And you have to present um, a seminar. So to the whole public here, whoever wants to come at least, um, on idea or topic of your choosing, or you can do it on your research. I chose to do it a topic on my choosing, of my choosing. And I think Nicole did as well. Yep. And then after that, So basically the end of your second year, you have your oral comprehensive exam. And that's like the big Kona in the chemistry (laughs) department. department. Um, It's showing your committee your plan for the rest of the time that you're here and showing what you've done so far um, to get towards those goals. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just basically tells you if you pass, you can continue on. If you fail, they might suggest getting a master's. You could fail with revisions and they just want you to redo a paper or something like that. But that's like the biggest hurdle to jump within 
like the five to six years of your PhD career. They also have you do, uh, in addition to like a proposal for what you're going to do on your own research, they also have a, you do a proposal on something else. And it feels so stressful doing them both at the same time. But at the end of the day, like, like if you like your proposal for the outside topic, you're like, oh, hey, I just looked at something that's not my science. And look, I'm so smart. My skills are transferable. And so that feels good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the hardest part is like of orals. Not the hardest. One of the hard parts is you, having to create your own research project on a whole different like field, basically. And you're just starting from ground zero. I think, did you mention the defense too? Nope. Oh, then you defend. And that is when you are ready to leave after you've written your thesis. Presumably you've published a couple papers um, and then you meet in front of your committee and that is open to the public if it is a PhD defense. Um, And then they decide if they'll let you leave or if you're stuck (laughs) here. (laughs) So just, so... So in that first, say, two years, you you finish your classes, you take your candidacy exam. Is that a written exam? Um, all of our exams, the candidacy, the second year seminar, um, the oral comprehensive exam are all have a written portion, which is just a paper. And you have an oral presentation. Yeah. So you have like all of the work. So and then when you take your comp comprehensive exams, do you get a master's degree? No, some, some programs do that. Not, not chemistry at Penn state. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and then you just said, you sort of said after your comps, you do your defense, but there's some work in there too, right? Yeah. That's the like open space, like free range time where you really get to nail down your publications, explore the content of your thesis and really get the bulk of uh, what I would say is the bulk of your experiments done. Is there anything that you didn't expect Pop, that popped up um, in graduate school? Yeah, I didn't expect so much um, like mental fortitude to be required. And so I think that in undergrad, you have a lab experiment that has been like rigorously tested by the people who are assigning you the work and they know what the outcome is going to be and it's right or it's wrong. And so that is what you become accustomed to. And then you get like to designing your own experiments. And it's like, I got this result. It's not a yes or a no. It's some weird gray area. I have no idea how to interpret it. I need to do another experiment to know how to interpret it. And like that one turns out and you're like, this doesn't fit into what I thought the story would be. And so then like looking at it, reassessing and just, I didn't know that I was going to fail so much. It just, it was disheartening a little bit, but then you learn that the failure is a result. It's a positive result. You learned that's not going to (laughs) work. So... Yeah, I'll have to back like that up. I agree with you. Um, it takes a lot of um, trial and error, and you really have to self-motivate yourself. Um, it takes a lot of that because no one's structuring what you have to do besides within your, like, your first and second year. After you get past that, it's, like, it's all up to you. It, the timing's on you if you don't do the work then you're going to be here forever. But if you do the work, like you'll see positive results and you'll be able to get a job, hopefully. (laughs) And we work on these like niche problems that are, that's why scientists have so much trouble telling you about what they do. Cause you want to be like, are you curing cancer? Yes or no. And it's like, well, I might be working on something that could one day be used in a process to cure cancer. And so it's really easy to slip out of the motivation and be like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? And so you have to remind yourself. Yeah, that's a really good point. Reminding yourself the motivation for your research. Do you have time to do things other than research? Yes. I'd say Nicole and I have an ample amount of time to do things that are not research. You squeeze in a prolific amount of things. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So we do quite a bit of outreach uh, within the community, specifically for kids. Um, We are both a part of the Graduate Women in Science organization here. Nicole was the president last year, and I'm the vice president this year. Um, We've held other positions within GWIS as well. I also, we're also involved in MRSEC, uh, the Education Outreach Team, mm-hmm. um, Center for Nanoscale Science. We do outreach through there, which basically is focused on Kids Day Arts Fest. If, mm-hmm. Yeah, if you yeah. know what that is. Um, we organize basically a good majority of the booths um, for Arts Fest for the kids. 
Um, we go to Exploration Use, which is mm-hmm. set up by the Science Science U Department in Everly College of Science. Um, a lot of outreach. Yeah, <laughs> we really are passionate about outreach, and we could probably go on like a ten minute tangent about why we think it's so important. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, like strictly, do we have time to have? like personal lives because I feel like there's this trope that graduate students are in lab all day every day and like go home rinse repeat and that could be true it's something to consider when you're thinking about the school and the lab you want to join but fortunately we also are big exercise enthusiasts we're both cycling instructors so that's my time to like get back to center none of my experiments worked pedal it out (laughs) yeah Yeah. that's but that's basically it that's Almost all the time we have is research, are we here and there, and uh, exercising, which I think exercising is very important for your mental um, abilities, especially being in grad school. It's a big, big help. What's at the end of the tunnel? Is, are you planning an academic career? Are there, are there other options if you don't want to pursue an academic career? Mm-hmm. I'll let Nicole go second on this one. <laughs> um, uh, there's quite a few avenues you can take um, after a PhD. You can go to academia, get a postdoc, and then become a professor at like a teaching or research institute. You could go to industry and become like a research and developer, senior scientist, things like that. Um, You could also work for a government agency. Um, You could do science writing, science editing, stuff like that. Like there's so many probably that I obviously did not name because they're not things that I have looked into or or that we don't get a lot of exposure to, um, which is possible. Um, For me particularly, I want to go into industry and do research and development. Yeah, I just accepted a job with PPG, so that is so exciting. But I'll speak to industry a little bit. Even within industry, it's not just like you go to a company and are a scientist. There's like a plethora of things you could do. You could be a bench chemist for your life and you could rise through the ranks and become one of the most like highly valued chemists at the company. You could move over into like people management and become a manager. You could move over to marketing and start talking to like the sales department and all non-technical scientists. And so if I had to guess my forecast right now, it'll be funny to check back in like five years, but I would guess that's probably the route I'm gonna go because I like science communication a lot. We'll see. So thanks for talking about grad school kind of in general. I think that'll be really helpful for people who might be interested or considering grad school, but maybe you can now talk a little bit about the research that you're doing. What is the project that you're working on? So we both fall under the umbrella of studying particle assembly and specifically particles that are around the micron dimensions, which for people don't know, I think your hair is like what, 100 micron in diameter? Don't quote me on that. It's it's pretty small. So we study really teeny tiny particles that you can't see with your eyes. Um, And so how do you see them? How do you move them around? And so a lot of our time gets devoted to either making the particles or imaging them to see, did we make what we think we made or did they look like what we expected when we bought them? Um, Then once we know we're good with the particles, we make a bunch of devices that we can use to move them around because again, they're so teeny tiny. If you can't see them, you can't just treat them like a set of Legos. Um, And so me and Albany develop strategies to be able to control them in real time. Um, Yeah, yeah. and um, to control them, we basically use electric fields Um, Within the field of particle assembly, uh, people use a lot of different methods, um, such as evaporation or magnetic fields or even um, like different chemical interactions. Um, But we stick with electric fields um, and they can assemble with those electric fields um, due to the polarization of charges between the solvent that we keep them in and the particle itself. And so sometimes we do this because we just like thinking about how to move around these particles. Like fundamentally, that's kind of a cool thing. But we also have a collaborator where they'll come to us and say, like, if you could put particles together in this way, it'll interact with light and do this cool thing. And so like an example application that like I would like to emphasize, I'm not actually going to be able to make invisibility cloaks, but it's invisibility cloaks. So it's not like 
Harry Potter, you throw it on and never get seen again. But um, if you align particles in just the right way, it could cloak a certain wavelength of light. And that's really interesting and cool. And so things like that. So uh, what, what are the types of particles that you're working with? What are they composed of? So we use pretty different sets of particles, even though I'm starting to collaborate with Nicole Moore um, as she's going towards graduation. Um, I use dielectric particles, so silica, just glass particles, um, between one and two micron. Uh, and I use titanium dioxide. Um, they have different responses within the, field, within the field, so that's why I'm interested in those. Yeah, I use, um, I use these segmented particles that have stripes of metal and then stripes of it's just like empty space, but it has glass, a glass shell around it. So it's kind of like glass. And so like, why? That seems really arbitrary and weird. And so the, the point that we emphasize when we bring up whether or not it's metal or dielectric is usually because if you think about the way these types of materials interact with light, it's very different. If you look into like a mirror that is coated with metal, you see your reflection. If you look out a window, you see what's outside. And so a lot of our time gets spent carefully choosing particles that will have interesting interactions with light for the application we need it to. Mm -hmm. Also, the like I mentioned, the, uh, the SiO2, the silica, and the titanium dioxide respond differently in the electric field. Nicole's particles do as well. As you change the amount of like metal, the gold, versus the amount of empty space or like the shell, it changes how it responds in the field. So you can control the particles in different ways. It's always a fun challenge because it's like, okay, I've settled in on a particle type I want for my application. And so our type of, the way that we control them is like Albany said, by electric fields. And so now you put them in the electric field and it doesn't do what you wanted it to do. Or, and so like figuring out those types of challenges or learning about why that is the case is the crux of what we study. So you say you use electric fields to control your particles. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so to, to discuss it, I'll start at the very basic. So we usually have our particles in some sort of solution. It's typically water. Um, and so then we design these really tiny, they're called electrodes. It's just a piece of metal that has the design that we have made by some sort of process in Penn State's MCL or nanofabrication facilities. Um, and so then by attaching a machine called a function generator, uh, you can apply an electric field. And this is really cool because when you do that and you have your particle solution on top, um, the types of forces that we use to assemble particles, they pretty much almost instantly respond, um, which is really neat to watch. And so basically we hit a button after we've set up our electrical connection, make sure nothing's short circuited and everything is the way it's supposed to be. We press a button and we watch them orient or we watch them get pushed away from the areas where the metal are or come into where the metal is. Um, and so we get real time response that is totally tunable with what we do with the electric field. Yeah, so like by changing the voltage and the frequency that we apply, we can change how the particles assemble, depending again on the the solvent that we're in, typically water, and then the particles. Um, yeah. We like this because, like, not to get like super deep into it or anything, but if you think about like the most fundamental type of particle assembly is called self assembly. It's if you leave a bunch of particles by themselves, what do they do and how do they interact with one another? Um, and so with electric fields, it's cool because we're exerting a means of controlling it that's a little bit reconfigurable if you're using the right parameters. And so like as soon as I turn the field off, the particles no longer assemble the way they did anymore because that driving force is gone. And so we like it because we can control them like instantly almost sometimes. That was a lot of words. Um, we can control them very quickly and we can also change how we control them, which is fun. And are you designing, like you mentioned the electrodes that you're getting built at the NanoFab lab? Are you designing something on there that's controlling the way that the particles assemble? So there's a lot of, there's like simple things. Like you can design things to be, I, I don't know, you can design very simple things. But what one project we are working on right now is creating like a template. So by the way we design our structures, that will change what the electric field profile looks like. And that 
is done by people who have degrees in something that are way smarter than me. And so you can you can learn a little bit about that. But what we're working on is having actual physical structures there that we make by 3D printing, like micro 3D printing tiny structures and trying to get our particles to interact with the structures. And so one thing that we're recently doing is I made this giant cone looking shape and it has like a little shelf in it. And the idea is that I'm hoping particles will go into the shelf, kind of like books on a, on a bookshelf, if there are any. Um, and so it, the idea is that having that extra surface there will stabilize the particle interactions. That's a little technical. But basically, we have the ability to create anything we want to try and make the particles do anything we want. And so if, if we had a God complex, we'd be set right now. <laughs> And for sim we have simpler designs as well. Um, what Nicole mentioned is the 3D stuff. Um, we also have 2D based electrodes. That's based most of what I use. Um, and they can be as simple as coplanar, which is just like two pieces of gold, really thin on a glass cover slip. And you just put your particle solution on that and it will just apply an electric field across that. We also have things like quadrupoles where it'll make like a little square. Um, we have interdigitated where it's like basically your fingers interlocking and you have spaces like that. Um, and those the d different designs can create different structures. Um, so that's one reason why we have these different types of electrodes. And then the, the shapes and, and things that you're getting out of those, do those have different optical properties that you're trying to control and trying to understand? So it depends. Um, some of the electrode designs that I use are mo some just to understand the fundamental behavior of the particles with one another. Some electrode designs are inspired by our collaborators for a specific optical response. Um, and they design the electrodes specifically to control the particles to a certain location. Yeah, for me, especially with the stuff I've been doing with 3D printing, that's like the pie in the sky dream. Right. Like if I could make that happen, I would want a second PhD. Um, yeah, so the ideal goal would be like, oh, yes, now you can build up any structure you want to have any optical response you want. But in terms of practicality, sometimes the structures that might make cool optical things happen aren't practical from an assembly standpoint. Sometimes they are not practical from a fabrication standpoint. You can't make them. Um Sometimes they're not practical from a viewing standpoint. And so some if I'm doing this assembly, I want to see it to make sure I know what's going on. And this is how I know what field conditions to use, how I know that everything is going correct. And so if I make a structure that is too small to see or not in, in line with the plane of what you're seeing with the microscope, um, practical limitations limit that. And so then at that point, we kind of use it to learn fundamental knowledge like, oh, if I change how far spaced out my features are, does that change how much the particles group together? If I change how big the things pushing the particles are, does that change how they're grouped together? And so both fundamental and optical things we can get from it. Yeah, that's a really important point. And then how much of what you're doing is sort of predictable that, you know, if you have these particles and you can make them go into this configuration, that it should be able to do this? And how much is sort of experimental? What happens if we take these particles and put them in this configuration? Um, I'd say it's a lot more the second thing. I like some of the particles that we use have been well studied. So silica particles have been studied a lot in particle assembly, uh, both with and without electric fields. And so you can or at least I can kind of guess what they would do in a certain um, electro design in electric field. Um, but there's other particles and other designs that I'm just like, I am not sure. So it's a lot of experimenting there. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really nice combination of the two of them because the you know, with the types of driving forces we think about, there are physical properties that can control it, like something conductive in an electric field behaves different than something that's insulating. And so you can fundamentally wrap your head around how that works. But then sometimes, like for my particles, I put those two materials together. And so, well, now what is it going to act like when you put those two together? And so a lot of it 
is, I think, building a base knowledge for your system, doing enough control experiments to be like, okay, now I think I can predict what's happening and then doing it and being like, oh, no, I was wrong. Now I learned something new. Yeah, that's actually something that Nicole and I have kind of thought about recently since we're starting to do the, the 3D printed templates. We use the simpler electro designs that I mentioned before, where they're coplanar and like flat on the surface. And we, if we do an assembly in those type of electrodes, we can learn a little bit more about the particles assembly behavior. And then we can be like, okay, if we put these in the 3D uh, templates, what's what do we think is going to happen? So we can use it as like a starting off point. So are there any real world applications for your research? Yeah, I think that um, it's kind of not the most satisfying answer in that the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is not going to result in a product that an everyday consumer can purchase and have in their house. But generally, I would say learning about particles and solutions and how they behave in in context to other solutions or driving forces to move them around could be used a lot, for example, in LCD screens. Um, the way they work is there's a, a electric field applied and, and different materials align or, or disalign with that. Um, and so it kind of ranges from like LCD screens to, to like um, treating cancer, um, heat dissipation in different materials, um, kind of things like that. So that was cool. Yeah, I had no idea that you know graduate students did so much. I thought they just spent most of their time in the lab researching, but I mean, they're doing a lot of stuff. Right, and it's really cool that Nicole and Albany use some of their time outside of the lab to really engage in, you know, engage the public in science education. Yeah, it's very important, especially in times like these. So if you want to learn more about Nicole and Albany, we'll have links in the show notes below. Yeah, thanks for joining us on another episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That, season two. And if you haven't already, go back and check out the episodes from season one. You can find them wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a comment. Dad tells me what to say. Are you sure? I'm not a thousand percent positive. There might be. We're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can we just not. skip that. Yeah. I didn't think there was. <laughs> Maybe That's not. Terrifying. Usually whenever I question Albany, she's always right. I'm here to make the everyday person feel like they know what you're talking about. So that's my job. It's pretty cool to hear. It's pretty neat to see. It's pretty cool to hear. I say something stupid like, yeah, I never realized the graduate students did all that stuff. And then you have a rebuttal. Twitter's where it's at. Twitter sucks. I love Twitter. Facebook sucks. Facebook sucks. So that was cool. Yeah, it's, you know, I almost said it's really neat to see. To engage in, you know, public education of science. Those words didn't come out in the right order. <laughs> Adios. Does that, was that everything? Did we get all the bits? <laughs>